Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Solis, and with me, as always, is my very, very talented friend, who is a general of her very own army, the Mixtress DC Gina. <laughs> Louise, that's pretty funny, actually. I'm just thinking about the way my headset looks on my right now, and I'm like thinking of Hamilton. So, <laughs> yes. So the answer is yes, I am. Are you going to break out and dance and song in a minute? <laughs> I mean, I am coming to you from my farmhouse that was built in 1767. So yes, I can. Do you know that would be the first? We've never done the show in song. Like there's never been like a, a musical version of the designated drinker show. <laughs> I also haven't had this much whiskey in a long time. So who knows what happens next? Who knows? <laughs> we are listed explicit, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to clean it up a little bit, and we're going to start hitting the books, and we're going to go back to grade school. You ready? I'm ready. So speaking of grade school, did you know that George Washington only had a grade school education? There you go. All right, I got more for you. And did you know his teeth were not made of wood? is noted in history that he actually ruined his natural teeth by biting on walnuts. Hmm. I think there's, a, I think a nutcracker might be faster, but you know, who knows? So anyway, um, and did you also know that George Washington, he was not just our first president, but he also was the first mule breeder. Because, you know, to make a mule is a horse and a donkey. Yeah. He was the first one to do that in the United States, apparently. According to my research, anyway, which is basically on the Googles. The Google. And then <laughs> some. <laughs> like that's an, like an actual book on the Googles, you know. <laughs> that's what the kids say today. Um, and one of, the, one of the most like maybe more morbid but fascinating facts I found about good old George was he basically defied death many times, many, many times. So, yes, he was a tall and robust man. But get this, at various times throughout his life, he had diphtheria, tuberculosis, a smallpox, malaria, dysentery, quinsy, just so you know, is an inflammation of the throat, carbuncle, which is these really gross blisters on the skin, apparently, and pneumonia. And I remember his time, this time, I mean, many people died of these things singularly. He had all of them. Didn't he die of pneumonia? Eventually, no. I will get there. Oh. He also he also <laughs> he also survived a near death drowning in an ice clogged river, as well as the burning and the massacre at Fort Necessity. He even survived two horses being shot out from underneath him, and apparently four bullets passed him so close to him that it pierced his clothing. Wow! I know, I know, right? And that all happened in one battle. But to your point, what actually did kill good old George? was basically the common cold or a complication of common cold. It set in as an infection, which if it were today, it was basically cured by the common z pack. But yeah, almost the common cold. All of those things and the common cold is what took down good old George. Wow. I know. I know. Surprising, huh? They didn't put that in Hamilton, so I don't, I don't know that. If it wasn't in Hamilton musical, I don't know the history. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. To all my teachers and all my education, I'm joking. I, I did pay attention. I would say that I didn't know any of those. I, I, I didn't know any of those things. But anyway. But you forgot the best fact about him. Which one is that? He loved ice cream. Well, me, well was it before or after the, the teeth, though? Because I'm thinking if he, like, jacked up his teeth that bad, who would want cold ice cream? All I know is that my children's teacher in kindergarten had this whole thing about George Washington and ice cream and all of the ice cream and, and the ice cream that came from Mount Vernon and all the stuff. And I live here in Middletown, Maryland. Well, that makes sense because Alexandria, Old Town Alexandria, which is not far from Mount Vernon, was uh, listed as like the number one city for ice cream for like five years in a row or something. So maybe. All right, let's bring on their new guest so we can get the facts about the ice cream. Yeah, but he can set us straight. So all this talk about George Washington will finally bring Gina and I to today's designated drinker. He's the director of historic trades at George Washington's Mount Vernon. He is Steve Bayshore. Welcome to the show, Steve. Oh, it's an honor to be with you. And uh, I learned a little bit of history there myself. You're the knowing man here. Was 
any of did any of that like did it sing was any of it true yeah tell us you tell us it's a lot accurate yeah very accurate and he did also love hoe cakes which are like a corn pancake oh. and he loved honey and butter so as a dental issue mm. that was another thing that was noted that he, he enjoyed those very much but you can imagine dentistry in the 18th century in fact people always we all romanticize history a bit we all that love it and when guests come to mount vernon they'll tour with me and i'll they'll might say, well, I, gosh, it's so neat to live back then. And I usually say, well, how about dentistry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to go to a dental appointment in 1787? I don't think so. So it, it's like any era, there's interesting and good. And then there are things that were difficult. And uh, he had a lot of problem with his teeth, certainly. Yeah. Well, I kind of skated over where the teeth really came came from, but that's a whole nother story. That's the yeah. talk about dark dentistry, but nonetheless, um, so tell me, in your wildest dreams, Steve, did you ever imagine yourself overseeing our country's father's distillery? No, it's funny. People ask me sometimes, how did you get into where you are today? And, you know, I, I kind of fell backwards into it. Many years ago, uh, getting a history degree, I ended up working at a park system that had a historic mill, a water-powered mill. And I ended up apprenticing under someone there for three years and learned to, to grind grain, which in the end, you know, leads to whiskey at some point, grinding grain. And so I worked actually at two other historic sites over the years in Virginia and came to Mount Vernon 14 years ago, just as the, the reconstruction of Washington's distillery was being completed. So I, I kind of entered the door at a very auspicious time and got to be in on the ground floor. And all my milling and grain experience, you know, helped me in, in what we do in the distillery. So I've been you know, really fortunate kind of just to be at the right place at the right time, I guess, but to have some of the skills that were needed. It's funny when you said you kind of fell in it backwards, I immediately thought, well, it's better to fall on your ass than your face. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> well, if you drink enough whiskey, you might fall the other way as well. But no, I, I came in at the right time and, and the story of the distillery was, t was launching and it's an interesting story about the farms at Mount Vernon. And so I, I you know, I feel fortunate to have entered Mount Vernon as an employment at that time because it was really exciting as it launched. It was a big story. It, you know, it, it still is a big story. I mean, every time we do anything with a distillery, it reaches a wide audience and press. And so all these years later, you know, if we release a new product, it's amazing how many stories come out of it. So people love history and they love they love spirits and all that goes with spirits. Well, it's interesting. Some of the guest distillers you've had, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've worked with a number of big names everyone would, would know. Um, Fred Nove, Jim Beam, uh, Dave Pickerel, the late great Dave Pickerel, who passed away a couple of years ago. He was our consultant for many years. Uh, Whistle Pig Rise, his big whiskey that you'll know. We've worked with Joe Dangler, who used to be at A. Smith Bowman, and he made Virginia Gentleman for about 34 years. Along the way, others have stopped in to work with us. Becky Harris at Catoctin Creek Stilling. She's, she's an awesome friend. Uh, and Lisa Wicker, who's our consultant. We also just had Widow Jane on the show, too. Oh, you did? Did you have Kelly? We did have Kelly. We did have Kelly. She stopped by and she brought us some You'll Never Walk Alone, which is just for our listeners, just so you know, with all the proceeds, 100%. This is terrible, but it's shameless, but it's for good cause. 100% of the proceeds of that go to USBG, right? And CORE, which is Children of Restaurant Employees. So, yep. Yeah, it's a great it's a job. That's a shameless plug, but it's a good, a very good cause. Yeah. So, and, and Lisa, the head distiller and blender there at Widow Jane, has been working with us for about five years now. And in addition to that, we've had some Scottish folks uh, come along the way because Washington's Scottish farm manager, James Anderson, is the man that really was the idea man behind building the distillery. So, We've collaborated with John Campbell and Lafroy a couple of times. Andy Camp, who used to be at Cardew, where Johnny Walker's made. And Bill Lumsden of Glenmore and G. Wow. Wow. I always like to say that Mount Vernon and the story of Washington and the distillery brings people together. And there's a range of people that come to Mount Vernon for various experiences. But the distillery seems to bring in a unique group of people in the spirits industry. And that's been a lot of uh, learning for us, but also just fun times with people like that. You know, a lot of humorous things happen when you get 25 distillers in a room like that. <laughs> a lot of stories. And, and, and so it's been quite the ride for us. But along the way, we've created a lot of very special brandies and whiskeys and rum. And, and it's and it, I don't know if it, I'm sure not everyone knows this, but I mean, it's not a modern facility. Yeah, that's a key. Point. Yeah, give us the history. Go. The history, you know, and then we'll talk about how it functions today, but the history really starts in 1797 when Washington's coming back from being president and he hires a new farm manager to run this 8,000 acre property that he owned. And so it was 
quite the property, 12 miles of waterfront along the Potomac. So my research said that that at the time of Washington's death, that property was worth $800,000 then, which would be $1.5 million in today's dollars. Hard to quantify that sometimes because... Uh, $1.5 million? If it was 800000 it would be a lot more than $1.5 today. Yeah, like $15 billion. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But suffice it to say, we've done wealth analysis on Washington. He wasn't the wealthiest man in Virginia, but he was likely in the top 10 or 15. There were other Virginia landowners that owned more businesses and more property than he did. Uh, but he was certainly in the top. The, the problem being a farmer is you're often land rich and cash poor. So it doesn't mean cash flow is always there. But he had one of his farms out where he had a water-powered mill called Doug Run Farm. And, and Mr. Anderson, the Scottish gentleman he hired, writes Washington after getting the job and proposes a distillery. So it's really Anderson pushing Washington to get into this. And I think he did have to nudge him a bit because Washington, at time of retirement from the presidency, was 65. Oh, interesting. So after retiring from the presidency, Washington was really looking to downsize, you know, and, and come home and retire. And But Mr. Anderson had other plans, and he, he really convince Washington that building a large distillery next to his grist mill would be a great business and profit center. And that's what it turned out to be. Oh, yeah. Although it took some convincing because Washington is pretty frugal with money. So the first distilling done at Mount Vernon in 1797 was done in the Cooperage where they made barrels for the flour mill. No. Oh. And that's really something where you see Washington's um, wise use of money. He said, okay, you can make whiskey there, but use the Cooperage. Yeah. And what he was really saying is let's see if this works. And so keep in mind, whiskey in the 18th century was not barrel aged. So it was a white whiskey. It went right to market as a clear alcohol, which was good for quick turnaround of profit. So with Alexandria being so close, that was his market town. And so they made about 600 gallons of whiskey then in the cooperage. It sold very well. Washington was pleased and that led him to build a larger dedicated distillery that they constructed over the winter of 1797, 1798. What, what did they call that whiskey when it went to market? Do you know? Well, back then, uh, they would have just called it common whiskey. Uh, so it didn't have a label, wasn't bottled. Whiskey was brought in casks. Oh. Uh, bottling of whiskey as a standard practice didn't start till the 1870s in America. Mm. Old Forrester was the one that really led the way on that. And so it would have gone into town in a keg, in a cask. But if you owned a tavern and you were a smart business person, you would have said, you know, this came from General Washington's distillery. And that would have obviously sold it. And and we know he sold a lot because 1798, the first year it operated, they sold 4,500 gallons of whiskey in Alexandria. Wow. 1799, the last year of his life, is really the record year. They did 10,942 gallons of whiskey. They did about three to 400 gallons of peach and apple brandy and a small amount of persimmon brandy. And luckily, we have all the ledgers and records, so we can go right to the original documents and see all this production. Wow. Oh, that's so cool. Persimmon brandy. Did you guys bring that back yet? Because I want that. <laughs> if it had COVID hadn't happened, that was in our pipeline to try to pull off last year, but we are going to pull that off. This year, we're doing some different things, a little bit of rye and some brandies, and we'll see how the fall is. I would like to be part of the development of cocktails with the persimmon brandy, because that is cool. So cool. We can make that happen with your talent and help, and we'll make the juice for you. Ugh. And we see what we can develop. That is the coolest. I, I wanted to plant for some trees here. I'm on the I'm in Middletown. So I'm like across the river on the other side. Not too far really. We take like 15 down that way. But persimmons apparently grow really well here. Yeah. And I wanted I wanted to try it. I was like, mm -hmm. all right, I never had this much land in my life. Let's do it. <laughs> You're in a nice spot. Yeah, it's pretty up there. So yeah, that's that's our plan to, to bring that back because we've made everything that was made in the distillery in the 18th century, we've recreated. And we've gone outside the portfolio two or three times on some different projects. So, But basically that, that year of 1799 was really a, a very profit rich year for Washington and the distillery. But then sadly, he died in December that year. What happens is it, in the will, he leaves the estate to his wife, but she dies, at, Martha dies in 1802. And then three nephews inherit the Mount Vernon. They split it in thirds. And one of them inherits the mill and distillery and carries it on a few more years. It was never really as profitable after Washington died. And then in 1814, a fire occurred there and burned it down. So really you have to fast forward to 2001 or 1999, when Mount Vernon reacquires that property where the mill is and does archaeology and then realizes there's enough below ground here 
all the features of the distillery were there. Oh, I mean, it had five stills, it had the boiler, we found the mash floor, all these drains, the original well the water came from. And, and we have the grist mill that had been restored years before right next door. So we were able to raise the money and, and we worked with the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States, who was the big donor that a lot of the major companies, you would know the names, helped fund Washington's distillery reconstruction. And we opened in 2007 and we operate the old way. We run five wood-fired pot, copper pot stills. We row mash by hand in big 120 gallon wooden mash tubs. And we grind the grain in the mill uh, with water powered machinery. That's crazy. So you really step back in time with us. There's a few things we do when we, we filter and bottle at the end that we do because we are in a modern market. But, and we also barrel age. So we do have whiskeys and brandies that are barrel age because we are in that market we want to sell to people today. But we also always make an unaged rye, which is as close to the 18th century whiskeys you can get. What have you found in there? Did you find any bottles that were not opened? Oh, no. Or any, ca- ca- any cast or anything? Nothing? No, all that long gone, long gone. Um, when they did archaeology, they found bits of uh, spigots that were... Uh, computer and they found you know obviously items for people living there because there were people living on the site and they you know so it was was you know a lot of the stuff that would have been more important to us today like equipment wise or the stash that was hidden all that was gone long gone that's always the best thing right about a history of like booze and stuff is finding um the unopened bottle so you can have like basically you can read every recipe in the world but if you don't know what it tastes like Mm -hmm. it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and then all of a sudden you know some you know it's an estate sale and somebody all of a sudden's like oh i have a whole keg of washington's whiskey and you're like what and you you know what i mean not saying that that's what they found but it's it's an interesting but it's not unheard of we've had many guests on the show who will say they found a bottle or a something from a hundred plus years ago under somebody's bed or in somebody's estate and it's kind of crazy that that those things do happen well i think the most famous story recently of that a few years ago was the uh the shackleton's whiskey that was in uh on that south pole expedition they found that was 1890s that they had had to abandon camp and they got that whiskey that was left and brought it back to scotland and they were able to extract it through the lab and recreate that through blending barrels so there are things that happen like that but you know unfortunately for us I think all those 18th century folks consumed all of Washington's whiskey in Alexandria. <laughs> and uh, you know, he, what was neat, though, is that we were able, through the combination of primary sources and archaeology, to we're able to paint a pretty good picture of what happened there. And, and when we opened it, we thought we'd just, our job at Mount Vernon is education and preservation. That's our main mission. The mill already made product, you know, cornmeal and grits and things. And we thought, well, why don't we try to make a batch? And that's when Dave Pickerell came to help us in 2009. And that first batch sold out in three hours. And then we realized that we maybe have something we need to do more of. And so it helps, it helps to fund our educational preservation mission, but it also helps tell the story to everybody that comes. And I like the fact that the mill and the distillery are working buildings. They are not facades. It's a real working water mill. We ground for hours today, as I mentioned to you earlier. And, and the distillery is, is not, it's not a faux thing. You go in there, those stills run. Those, those um, we, we do row mash the way we do. So when people visit, they're getting a real trip back in time to how distilleries would have been throughout this country in the 18th century into the 19th, but also in England and Scotland and parts of Europe where these were the methods with these copper pots before the newer equipment was developed in the 19th century. It was all small batch distillation. And, and we've learned a lot from doing it. And, you know, along the way, we've made mistakes like you do, but we've gotten better at it. In the last several years, you know, I think we've put out some very high quality spirits. And and I think that makes us proud as a team because remember, I head up a very good team of men and women who have learned to run this place along with our consultants like Lisa Wicker, Dave Pickerell and others so that we can create quality product that comes out of the building. Because in the end, if you're not proud of what you're making, if it doesn't, if people don't enjoy it, whether it's food or whatever, you know, you have to question, why am I doing this? Yeah. You know, you want people to partake in it. Absolutely. And so we're super proud of, of where we are with it. And we're kind of hitting our stride because uh, over the next several years, there's a number of things we're going to make and things that are aging right now, longer aging profiles. So I just think for Washington's distillery in the modern time, we've just begun to 
hit our stride. That's awesome. That wow. I, it's it's what is really to your point is that it's taking a walk back in history, but you're not taking it. It's not um, it's not a homogenized space. You're actually paying honor and tribute to the original spirit that was being created there at one point in time. You've gone back to creating that as close as you can, which I think, um, I think that's, I think that's really cool that it's not, it's not just a, a it's not a gimmick. It's, 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 and, and obviously it's a big love and a passion for you because the amount of work and time that goes into working with like slightly dated technology to create a, an amazing product. That's hard. That's hard work. It is a lot of labor, a lot of hard labor, a lot of firewood, a lot of sometimes long hours if things don't go well. Yeah. And it's also once we start with that sort of batch process, you keep going till you're done. So there's no days off. We rotate some people, but you know, these are 30 to 35 day straight runs. Wow. And then, you know, and then you get a break. Yeah. But the point was with the building, you know, we could, we could upgrade some things and make it more modern, efficient, but that's not why we're here. Yeah. You know, we are reflecting the past and also telling the story. And, and so some of my staff sometimes say, well, can't we get something to stir this mechanically? <laughs> it's like, no, you have to row that. And that's how we, you know. Could you could you not get some of those mules that George Washington apparently bred? <laughs> I don't know where we put them. It's not that big of a building. But, uh, <laughs> but they would have, you know, some distilleries in the 18th century did have water-powered water wheels that had turned, you know, fermentation agitators. Mm -hmm. That's documented. In fact, in Alexandria, there's one, a rum distillery documented that had that. Had. It's, so the building is gone, though, unfortunately. Long gone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was a, there was a rum distillery right in Alexandria. So, so it, like that era, you know, the, the industrial age, the dawning of it, there, there's a lot more automation in certain industries than we would think today. Yeah. You know, the water mills are one thing, but if you think of the textile mills of New England, if you think of iron furnaces and things where they made uh, pig iron, there's a lot of water powered machinery that was applied. And they knew quite a lot about designing these larger machines. But for distilling, in the most cases, it's still, you know, except for uh, hand pumps, which they would have had. Wow. It's, it's yield, yield elbow grease to make it work. <laughs> so. so what you doing over there, Gina? Uh, sorry, I'm getting ready to um, make the drink. All right. So I want to talk about this recipe because I want to know a little bit more. Where did the tavern punch come from? So just so our, our listeners know, Steve sent us an amazing recipe that Gina then, because um, usually, as just Steve, you know, most of our listeners are used to Gina bringing out the recipes and she's uh, adapting one of yours. So that's great. Well, this came from a friend of mine, uh, Justin Cherry, who's an 18th century baker and a, and a chef. He used to work at Husk in South Carolina. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so he, he, we, he has an 18th century bake oven he built, so we grind grain for him. And I asked him for a couple of thoughts about this sort of thing some time ago. So in the 18th century, punches were extremely popular. So this is a, of course. a pretty typical tavern punch of that era. And it would, as you can see, the list of ingredients and the way they would uh, proceed with it pretty hefty amount of alcohol in this punch, as you can see. Uh, and in that time period, they certainly did consume a lot of alcohol. So you can imagine the parties, the dances, events like that at homes like Mount Vernon, this would serve, be served for a lot of people. And so this is typical of the mid 18th century. There were other rum punches like Martha Washington made a cherry bounce punch that was very popular that we've made at Mount Vernon before. But I think that was more well known. So, I, so this sort of typical tavern punch of the 18th century is what Justin had, had pulled together for me earlier this year. I thought it'd be nice for you in, in the program to, to work through this, this uh, punch recipe. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, wanna, I, well, I think we should make it. What do you think? Let's We're gonna, we can do, do it. that? Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. All right. So here's one of the things about punch, which I would find really fun um, from that time. Punch was a way for you to show off to your friends uh, what, how much money you had, right? <laughs> because it was expensive, not so much to get, you know, teas and stuff, even though those came from England and everything, but more importantly was how did you get citrus? Did you know somebody that was traveling that brought you citrus from another country or somebody on the boats? Were you wealthy enough that you had people employed on boats or how did you get the spices? Cause the spices came again from the spice, um, the spice route. So you would have not um, had access to those spices and spices. And I put together a medley of spices here 
that would be considered some of the most expensive spices. And cinnamon was one of them, but I kind of went something a little bit more um, that you would have found in this area at the time. Cinnamon uh, is definitely used, but you would have had cardamom, allspice, nutmeg, clove for sure. Uh, and that these would have been things that um, you would have really, if you had nutmeg like this, would have really have shown that you had some sort of wealth or connection or how you got this. These things were very expensive. To this day, nutmeg and um, green cardamom are very expensive. All spice came from the islands. So this just showed how you got around and like it was a way to show off like who you were in society and what you were able to afford. So was that was that their Instagram then? Yes. Yes. <laughs> they took lots of photos of these spices in 1748 and uh, posted them regularly. <laughs> My favorite uh, thing about a punch, and I like this recipe because it says to steep the sugar, the tea, um, and I'm gonna I'll read it off the, the entire recipe in a second. I'm just juicing a little bit of the juice. So in your recipe for our listeners, it says, and, and all of this will be available on designated drinker show, so you don't have to rush to get this. It says 24 ounces of boiling water, one bottle of Washington's rum. If you cannot get Mount Vernon's rum, you need to get an aged rum. From that time period, I, and this is my question for you, is how long would that rum have been aged when you say aged rum? That's a good question because that's a topic we discuss among distillers a lot in the 18th century because it could be, from my research, it could be two years was a long time back then for some spirits to age. Um, it could have been four years. There was a higher end product available that was aged longer. In fact, Washington was given a gift of rum that was 28 years old one time. Wow, wow. But that's, again, you we're talking about the wealth of creating these sort of punches and citrus and things available. So certainly that would have been for the wealthier class. But there was so much rum in early America and, and, and made in America. Some, they, they called it continental rum, if it was made here, or Barbadian or Jamaican rum. Yep, that's right. And so uh, it's hard to quantify the age, but I would say two years is a good probably zone for some of that that came in. How many years did you say? I'm sorry, I missed that. I said two years old from what I've studied might be a good zone, but gotcha. it's very hard to predict. And there, we haven't studied all the records that exist from the time. I don't have the Washington rum here. I have Hamilton's Blonde. Have you had this? I haven't tried that, but it, it's fitting. Hamilton was an aide de camp to Washington, so that's a perfect substitute to. Uh, so, but if this is this is his new. So I have two. I have Jamaican Gold which would be a little bit older. Mm -hmm. And then I have the blonde, which is a little bit younger. This is about three years. And I figured this was a better rum for this, for, for your time period. So is that okay? I think so because we aged, we aged our rum 28 months. So it fits right into the profile. And I need to come and get your rum because I don't know who, who distributes you in DC. Well, you can buy from our Mount Vernon retail shops, and we can ship to D.C. Ah. Uh, we, are, we are so small with our production. We don't distribute widely. We, we're at Mount Vernon shops, and you can also get it in a few ABC stores across the state of Virginia. But because of the COVID situation, the, the legislature in Richmond has changed some of the rules for distillers and distilleries, so we can ship within Virginia and from Virginia into Washington, D.C. So that might be one way, or you could come see me. And uh, we can taste, we can taste a number of things. There we go. Well, I want to come see you, and I I want people to enjoy your recipe. All right. So I took. So now we're going to go to the next part of this recipe. If everyone's following along and you're listening, so we've gotten to literally the rum. <laughs> All right. So we got 24 ounces of boiling water. Uh, we put the rum in there. We are now we've dumped that in there. We're going to put in a bottle of apple brandy in a second. But I wanted to talk about the prep of this. You take the 24 ounces of boiling water. You take eight bags of black tea. The tea is going to make a big difference for this. If you like loose tea, I would recommend a Keeman or um, a Darjeeling tea. If you're going to the grocery store and you're going to buy something that, you know, is pretty um, uh, close to that, I would get an English tea. So maybe like a, a breakfast tea or something. So it's really, really dark. And you want to steep it. And you're looking for a really, really dark color. Uh, when you do that. So I basically took my spices instead of doing it, what it said exactly. I took the tea bags, the sugar, the water, and then I added uh, in there, I actually used star anise, 
cardamom and a little bit of allspice and only because I was really inspired by the fact that I tasted this other rum. Now, if I would have had the wash the Washington rum, I probably would have stuck with the cinnamon that was in there. So basically at this point I would have been a showing off lady if this was um $17.99. I would have been like, look how fancy I am. Anyway, so uh, in here I've added the juice of four limes, the juice of two lemons, and now I'm going to add apple brandy. And again, if you are not in the market to get the um, Washington uh, George Washington apple brandy, which I recommend that we'll get, uh, I use something close to our heart, and Becky is an amazing distiller, and we're going to use the Catoctin Creek apple brandy. They are just in Percival, Virginia, so not too far away, and we're going to dump it in. Becky helped us make our one of our first brandy runs, so we have a nice connection on brandy with Becky and her husband, Scott. Could they be more lovely? Could they be more lovely, really? Scott was on the show just recent, just a couple months ago, and he was amazing. He was great. They're wonderful. So if you take this mixture that we've put together and everything, now if you, and again, the recipe will be, and all the instructions and all the tips that I'm saying will be on designateddrinker.show. How to also get in touch with Steve's go to the distillery and um so we're squeezing all that in there and if you are following this or you see this it's literally you know it's in one bowl now what you should do is take this bowl put it in your refrigerator and when you're making any sort of alcoholic drink and you're or or something that's going to be in the refrigerator overnight situation I would probably leave my spices in there overnight and I would definitely store it in a glass bowl or a glass a, some sort of glass pitcher or ceramic you don't want to put it in metal when it has citrus. It will change it. So we're going to pretend through the magic of um, podcast. Yeah. It's been eight hours or overnight in your refrigerator, and we're going to strain it. I've been waiting for your drink for hours. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and we're going to strain it off, and now you have a clear punch. So delicious, right? And you're smelling it. I have a question. Can this really be considered a punch without bitters? And is the tea supposed to be the bitters? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if that would, the element of the tea flavor is exactly like a bitters, but I think it's the bath that it all sits in. I would call it that. So, all right. But in the 18th century, this is, this is based on a, an accurate recipe. So, no, I love it. I'm asking all the questions. Steve, I need to know all of it. So let me ask you that. This, this is a good time to ask this question because, are you, Gina, with that question, are you saying most punches needed to have bitters to be considered a punch? They need to have five ingredients. Oh. They need to have bitters, sugar, spirit, water, and um, fruit. Citrus. Citrus. Did I say citrus? Alcohol. Maybe that's it. That's what maybe I'm missing. I don't know. Well, you said spirits. You said spirits. I said spirits. Yeah. So uh, citrus. Gotcha. And those are the five things to be to be made that because we didn't come up with punch um punch was given to us by our friends in india it was a uh, it, it means hand punch means hand in um oh in the middle yeah so we 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 thought we were cool but really they they had all that stuff going on in europe and this young little country stole a lot of that kind of history colonization <laughs> at its finest uh we did and you know you know, Steve, I have another question for you. Have you ever gotten your hands on the book American Beverages? I don't think so. So I just moved into so I just moved during this year and renovated a farmhouse. But I have this book called American Beverages, and we're definitely gonna become friends. Anybody's listening to podcasts right now, which I'm sure <laughs> friends will, will be eventually. I wanna recreate this one recipe that's in there, and maybe I'll just show you the book and then you decide. Okay. Because it's very cool. And it is an old beverage, very old beverage, but it is very indigenous to our area. Okay. So I'm guessing you can guess where I'm going with this. I think so. And it has, yeah. So I would love to just do it, just even if it was like a one-off for fun and, you know, and, and nobody drank it and we only did, that's fine too. <laughs> um, anyway, so you've made this punch and it's out in your refrigerator and now you've decorated it with some lemon and lime wheels. For fun, I would maybe toss in if you're going to serve it something in the summer some edible flowers or maybe some verbena leaves, stuff like that would be really pretty and make it really fragrant and a little bit of green with the orange, with nice golden color and the yellow, you know, makes it a little bit attractive. So on that note, I'm going to grab a ladle and a cup. I really don't know where anything is. I apologize. And a piece of ice. I, that's my next question. Did they use ice at Mount Vernon? Like where was his ice house? Yeah, that's an interesting story because there were actually two stories with that. Uh, if you stand, if you've been to Mount Vernon and stood on that portico, that that front porch and looked at the river, down to the right 
on the hillside, he had an ice house and it's still there, but they struggled to really keep ice, uh, you know, through that time period in the summers in Virginia. He later built a, what he hoped to be an ice storage in the, in the basement of the mansion, the cellar, and that didn't work either. So the, the struggle for ice was always a problem. And in fact, I read a farm report or, or the farm manager's letter to Washington in 1788 and Washington inquires about the ice. And he said, it would have been better to at least have packed snow in the ice house instead of doing nothing. So, so the quest for ice in the 18th century period was hard, but particularly at Mount Vernon, it just, you know, they, they had some good years with it and other years you did not have it accessible. Interesting. I, um, I love the stories of, um, anyway, cheers. Let's do it. Let's do a toast. Sorry. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh, that is beautiful. Yeah. I actually have the rum, which is a beautiful, beautiful bottle. Yeah, it's a 1750s style bottle. So the reason we've made the rum, because Washington didn't make rum, and obviously at the distillery, but it, when he was 19, he went to Barbados with his older half brother, Lawrence. Lawrence had tuberculosis, and they thought the island air would help him. So that's his only trip out of North America was to Barbados. And he learned about the, the culture. He learned about the food. He learned about being on the open ocean. Um, he uh, got smallpox there, as Louise mentioned earlier in the intro, and that proved fortuitous because during the American Revolution, smallpox was rampant, and once you have it, you cannot get it again. But Washington also during the war, just as an aside, he took the risky move of having the army inoculated. Wow. So you can imagine inoculations in the 18th century, but that saved that army from getting smallpox. <laughs> we could have been uh, still speaking with a different accent, I suppose, if he had not done that. I also have the apple brandy here, which we, we make, and we use apples from an orchard in Maryland, you'd be happy to know. And some of the varietals are apples that Washington would have grown at Mount Vernon in the 18th century. What's the, what, what are the apples that would have been um, indigenous to this area? Well, there were so many varietals back then, hundreds of varietals that are gone now. Yeah. But Hugh Crab, Newtown Pippin, and Roxbury Russet were three that we've identified. Um, and keep in mind, when you think about apples in the 18th century and you know this already i know it's uh, you know a lot of those apples aren't like the red delicious no. they didn't grow trees to eat these were for cider yep. yeah because they were super bitter it's super bitter and throughout the mountain record you can see cider and so what happened with prohibition which happened a lot of great distilleries went away for whiskey but entire apple varietals went away because people could not make spirit out of those anymore so, you know, uh, we're not, any of us, I don't think, big fans of Prohibition, but there's a lot of different things that damaged uh, many different alcohols, not just whiskey back then. So, but Washington had about 89 acres acres with the wow. orchard on one of his farms. And so peach, apple, persimmon. And, and so, you know, I we're going to make peach brandy at the end of March as well. We're going to do a small whiskey run and shift right into peach brandy. And so I'm really looking forward to doing that again. We've done it four, I think, four times now. Wow. So speaking of inoculation, I'm just voting for us um, when we all have that. We can, um, Gene is ahead of me on that one, um, that we all just end up at uh, Mount Vernon for a day, do uh, an episode or two and uh, sit back and. Uh... <laughs> that would be great fun. You know, we'll have the shuttle bus for y'all to get home and uh, yeah, things of that nature. But no, I'd love, I'd love to taste through a few things with you guys on site. And Absolutely. Then, uh, if you want to make a program happen from the distillery, it'd be a neat thing to do. Absolutely. Well, the good news is, is I don't live that far away from Mount Vernon. So Gina and I can have um, husband Dave be the designated driver. <laughs> As opposed to the designated drinker that we are at exactly, the moment. Exactly. Exactly. That's so. totally true. All right, Gina, I need you to do your bartending, your bartending one more time. Where are they going to go? You're going to go to designateddrinker.show to get the recipes, how to get the whiskey, how to get apple brandy. Please come. When will you reopen the distillery just for everybody to come? We will be open on weekends starting April 3rd. So with COVID yes. restrictions and things we're all facing, we the estate is open right now every day with the proper restrictions. Um, so you can visit the mansion. You can tour the grounds. There's a lot of land to walk around at Mount Vernon, a lot of gardens. The farm, we have a small farm site as well. The mill and distillery will open 
April 3rd and be open in weekends in April and May. That's great. And it's highly likely in May we are going to do whiskey tastings outside at the distillery. Oh, great. So stay tuned for that. Look at mountvernon.org for information. You can come and actually sample the spirits that we make there. As well as have a tour. It's amazing. So for our, for our little extend our bar ten, our bar keeping as Gina likes to call it because I was calling housekeeping. If you go to designateddrinker.show, we're going to have live links to Mount Vernon so that you can find out everything that's going on there. As well as if you look at the episode notes as you're listening to us on your smartphone, maybe you just swipe up and all of those links will be right there for you as well. And and we'd love to see everyone out at Mount Vernon. The one nice thing about our grounds is there's a lot of acreage to walk around outside. So for families, for people that want to come see and enjoy the gardens and the grounds, plenty of open spaces to, to spread out and enjoy the site. You can ride your bike. There is a path that goes right to Mount Vernon. I don't know how many times I've done that myself. That's what you used to do from Capitol yep. Hill. Yep. All right, Gina. I think this is you. Okay. We have one last question for you. So in this day and age, everybody identifies themselves with some sort of animal or a mythical being, a creature or something, and they're like, I really identify myself with a Rhode Island red uh, rooster because of its pronounced being and, and protectoring of the farm, right? If you could be one ingredient, whether it's for a spirit or for food, what would that ingredient be and why? What's your spirit ingredient? I love barley. Why? I love it. Um, there's something about it. Part of it being a miller, there's the way barley, the way millstones rip barley and the way it flows through the sifter, the barley hull dances across the top of the sifter. I love the smell of it. And of course, it's a key ingredient in any spirit, whether it's scotch, single malt, or it's uh, the rye whiskey we make or bourbon, you have to have the component of malted barley. So I would say that's that's where I would uh, I'd be comfortable right there. It's an amazing answer. Dancing across the, across the top, being a part of everything. I think that's what I just heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On that note... All right. Please, we raise your glass. Steve, amazing to meet you. I cannot wait to yes. meet you in person. I'm sorry that our paths took so long to cross. Happy to facilitate. No, it was fun talking with Louise early on and then working with all of you. And, and you know, we have a common interest in good food and good drink and also stories. It's obviously the stories are important. So um, we will meet on site. We'll see each other at Mount Vernon. And, uh, and we'll also convene downtown like we talked with our friend Bill at Jack Rose Dining Saloon at some point in the future when things are better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cheers to you both. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you Cheers. all. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.